Hi, my name is Dr. Jennifer Beck. In association with Orthopedic Institute for Children and UCLA Health, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today we're going to be talking about common musculoskeletal injuries in young athletes. I myself, for a little bit of background, am orthopedic surgery trained. I have a fellowship in pediatric orthopedics as well as sports medicine, with my sports medicine being emphasized on pediatric sports injuries. I am the associate director for the Center of Sports Medicine at the Orthopedic Institute for Children. I'm also an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at UCLA Health. First of all, most importantly, I'd like to encourage questions. Please go to Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. I'd love to answer them at the end of all of this presentation. Hopefully, we'll have a great discussion. First of all, I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. So our goals for today, I want to review initially why kids aren't just little adults. We'll go over some basic terminology and anatomy. Afterwards, I'm going to go through some of the most common musculoskeletal injuries that I see in our young athletes today going from the upper extremity, the shoulder and elbow, and then working down to the lower extremity with going over some hip, knee, and ankle pathology. So just a brief anatomy lesson of the difference between pediatric or skeletally immature patients versus adults which are skeletally mature. As we're growing young in an embryo and as we grow through life, we have bone form from the central portion of the bone and there's cartilage on the ends. You can see the cartilage in this graph is the blue portion at the ends of the bones. This yellow portion is the growth plate, which is also called the physis or the epiphyseal plate. Lots of names for the same thing, but you can think of it as the area that gets bigger and larger and allows bones to grow and get longer. Just to see how that correlates in radiology, this is an x-ray of a child's hand. In all of the different bones have different terminology to describe the different parts of the bone, but the important thing I want to show you on this x-ray is this line right here. You have one bone, which the diaphysis is the central portion of the bone, the epiphysis is the end of the bone, and this line right here is that epiphyseal plate or growth plate. You can see this highlighted in these different yellow circled areas, that there's growth plates as part of every single bone in the body. So when looking at hand x-rays, you see numerous through the fingers, the metacarpals through the wrist. Just to compare what a child's hand versus an adult hand x-ray looks like, again, you can see in these yellow circles where at the ends of the bones you have growth plates. As you become skeletally mature, which is around age 14 for girls and 16 for boys, you can see that those lines are now gone and it is completely formed into bone. Those growth plates are formed of cartilage, which doesn't show up on x-rays, which is why it's shown as a line, and that's something that can often be confused as a fracture. So a brief terminology lesson of things that I talk about on a daily basis that I also talk about as part of this presentation, just to understand what acute versus chronic means. Acute is something that is very sudden onset. You were in a car accident, you ran into a pole, you fell into a hole and twisted your ankle. But it's usually one type of event, a dramatic event that was abruptly changed how you felt. A chronic event is something that's typically slow to start. Often patients can't think of an exact event that started it. They just realize over time, gradually they had more symptoms and then gradually those symptoms worsened. An important thing, and it's a question I very commonly get in my practice, is what is the difference between a fracture and a broken bone? Well, I'd like to clear the air and say they are the same thing. The fracture is, the definition of a fracture is a broken bone. In our medical world, we do have a lot of different terminology that then talks about the location of the fracture, the orientation of the fracture, the complexity. Did it poke through the skin or did it not? But I do just want to emphasize that a fracture is the same thing as a broken bone. And lastly, also a big confusion that people often have is a sprain versus a strain. And this is a little bit of an anatomy lesson. A sprain is something that involves a ligament injury. So you can think of an ankle sprain. A ligament, just to remind you, is a piece of tissue that connects between two bones. A strain, on the other hand, is an injury to a muscle or a tendon, like a hamstring strain. And just to clarify what the difference is, a ligament connects two bones, whereas a tendon connects bone to muscle. So that's the difference between an, a sprain and a strain. Just to start going through some of our common musculoskeletal topics for today, I'm going to start with the upper extremity and start with the shoulder, which is a very common thing we're seeing these days, especially here in Southern California with all our baseball players, water polo players, volleyball players. 
There's three different topics we're going to go over, little league shoulder, and then we're going to talk about the difference between a separated shoulder and a shoulder dislocation, which is commonly confused between a lot of patients and parents. So just to go over little league shoulder, first of all, this is one of those chronic injuries. So something that doesn't have one event that typically starts it. But over time, my young athletes say that their shoulder hurts more and more after they're done pitching, after they're done playing tennis, things like that, uh, where they're having pain just worsening over time. We do very commonly see this in pitchers aged 11 to 14, hence the name little league shoulder. The cause of it is the, really the repetitive stress on this young growth on this young growth plate and young skeleton. We know that the growth plate, that physis we were talking about earlier, is the weakest part of the musculoskeletal system and is very prone to injuries, which is the prime difference between kids and adults when it comes to sports. So also there can be prop, improper throwing mechanics or high frequency of pitching that can cause this type of injury. And improper warm up and cool down can also lead to this injury. You can see in this picture that I show you a comparison of a healthy shoulder to a, an injured shoulder. This is the growth plate, which is a very irregular shape on the top of the proximal humerus, which is this is the top of the arm where the shoulder is. The comparison is you can see this area is very wide, it's separated, it looks very different than this growth plate does here. Those changes are due to the chronic stresses that this growth plate has been seeing over the duration of this athlete's play. What are the symptoms as I alluded to before? It's typically pain in the shoulder, either the top or the side portion of the shoulder, either with pitching and throwing and activities or afterwards. The treatment, thankfully, is most often conservative, so it doesn't involve surgery. It does, however, usually involve resting the shoulder and taking the athlete out of that aggravating sport for even up to four weeks, depending on how long their symptoms have been going on. We have to educate them during that process about how they can improve their warm-up and cool-down, as well as how to get better at pitching mechanics to avoid this problem coming back in the future. Also, I have to make sure and everybody and reinforce to everybody that pitch counts are very important to know and abide by. We have strong evidence that shows if you follow these pitch counts, these types of injuries do reduce. So really know and pay attention to pitch counts. They're there for your child's safety. So to go on to the common confused is the separated shoulder versus the dislocated shoulder. So a separated shoulder involves what's called the AC joint, which is up on the top portion of your shoulder. This is the HC joint versus this is the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint. The AC joint, A and C stands for acromioclavicular, which is the two bones that are connected at that joint. So clavicular is clavicle, the long bone in the front portion of your shoulder, and the acromion is a small portion of bone that comes off of your scapula that wraps to the top portion of your shoulder. In kids, they have a growth plate at this area. So this is a big difference between kids and adults. Where adults often get tears and injuries to the ligaments, kids often get fractures in this area. It can be very subtle to differentiate them, but often it can be seen either in clinical exam or on x-rays. The causes of how kids get these injuries is most commonly a direct blow to the top or side portion of the shoulder. For example, two football players going at, into a tackling and they hit the top of their shoulder, or someone even tripping and falling onto the side portion of their shoulder. Separated shoulder, typically you can see a bump on the top portion of the shoulder. They can have tenderness, swelling, and even some bruising or ecchymosis, we call it, that's around that top portion of the shoulder, but it can even extend all the way into the front portion of the chest. I do recommend getting an x-ray for this type of injury because it may change treatment or change diagnosis as we need to know what the extent of the bone injury would be and if they potentially have a fracture. This does rarely need an operation, thankfully, and often just requires a rest and, some, and a sling while their injury heals. Some patients do need physical therapy, but most often kids are eager to be get back on the field and get back onto the courts and are able to rehab themselves. These types of injuries, depending on the degree and how, how severe the injury is, can often take four to eight weeks to recover. So now to compare that to the shoulder dislocation. The shoulder is an interesting joint because you have to think about it like a golf ball sitting on a tee, is that you have this large circular structure sitting on a very small mounted structure. The ball is the humeral head, is the top portion of your arm, and that socket is the glenoid. It was designed as a joint that allows a lot of motion, so you can put your arm anywhere in space, but at the, the side effect of having not as much stability or containment. 
This makes the shoulder very prone to dislocating or coming out of joint. So when we say you have a shoulder dislocation, it means that, that that humeral head, that ball, has come out of the socket or the glenoid. Usually it comes out towards the front is the most common place, but sometimes it comes out to the back or to the bottom portion of the shoulder. The common causes of shoulder dislocations can be a, a fall into an outstretched arm, but it's very commonly seen in sports where positions of the arm are in this up and out position. Very commonly seen in sports like volleyball, basketball in particular, as well as water polo. Immediate symptoms, patients typically know that this has happened and they have immediate pain and deformity to their shoulder. They can't necessarily move their arm and this is something that requires emergent medical attention. You don't want to leave that shoulder dislocated for any longer than you have to. Once that shoulder gets properly reduced by someone who's trained in, or in shoulder reduction techniques, they'll often be put into a sling. I do recommend a referral to a sports medicine specialist for anybody who's actually dislocated their shoulder because their treatment may vary. The treatment, as I initially said, were as a sling primarily for three to four weeks in the beginning. But we know that there's a lot of high risk athletes now that we're getting a bit more aggressive with surgically intervening to try and reduce the damage and the long term complications from recurrent shoulder dislocations. We do know that after a patient has had a shoulder dislocation that some go on to have a lot of pain and weakness in that shoulder and may require physical therapy later on. And our worst fear is repeat dislocation. So their shoulder pops out numerous more times and more often it becomes easier and easier for the shoulder to dislocate if you get into that type of pattern. Again, that's why I recommend patients really see immediate sports medicine uh, provider care for these shoulder dislocations. Hopefully that's clarified the shoulder. I'm gonna move down to little league elbow and go down to the elbow now. Little league elbow is something we're seeing more and more commonly with year round baseball pitching and high volumes of uh, pitching and overhead athletes. It's pain on the inside part of the elbow and as you can see in this picture, the inside portion of the elbow sees a lot of stress, a lot of tension type stress as you go through a throwing motion. There's a growth plate in that area that's particularly sensitive and closes at a very late age, which causes this to be a common injury. We do see this in, in patients typically 11 to 16 years of age and really repeat throwing overhead athletes are the most common ones we see this in. The difficult thing is that little league elbow used to be a little bit of a catch-all term and we're now knowing and understanding that there's different types of little league elbow. Sometimes it can be a true fracture or a true, true broken bone. Sometimes it's just an overuse injury and more of a tendonitis and irritation of the tendons around the elbow. And sometimes it's actually a mixture of the two. So I think this is something that's very important to seek sports medicine care for. Similar to the little league shoulder, the causes of this are improper warm-ups, poor technique, as well as increased inactivity and not obeying those high pitch counts. So again, let me reiterate, paying attention to those pitch counts and really abiding by them. They're there for your safety. I do recommend seeing a specialist for an x-ray to try and help figure out if this is a fracture or if this is just a soft tissue injury. And an x-ray is usually what helps us decide that. Treatment from little league elbow is similar to little league shoulder that often does require rest and pulling out of that sport and stopping that aggravating activity. Physical therapy sometimes is need and it's really about education on proper techniques, warm ups as well as pitching. I can't emphasize enough, anybody who does repeat overhead activities, the importance of this sleeper stretch. Hopefully everybody's heard of that if you have an athlete who's an overhead athlete. We now know a lot more information about elbow injuries relating to shoulder injuries, and this stretch actually works on stretching the muscles around the shoulder and helps reduce the rates of elbow injuries. As you can see in this graphic, you lay on your side with your arm in a position in front of you. You use your other hand then to push your hand down towards the floor. You can do this in both directions, but you'll find that going towards your belly, towards the front portion of you is the more difficult way of doing this exercise. That's the really important one. You should be doing this anytime you're gonna be planning an overhead activities or if you're a pitcher or a frequent thrower. To move down to the lower extremity, I'm gonna start with the hip. Groin pulls are something we're also learning a lot more about in pediatric sports medicine. It used to be that any time a child had groin pain, they just had a groin pull and it was no big deal, you just played through it. A true groin pull is an adductor strain. The adductors are a group of muscles on the inside portion of your leg that attach up to the top of your pelvis, and it's really an injury up to the top portion of the pelvis, which is a true groin pull. 
We now know this is actually pretty rare in kids and there's a, numerous other diagnoses that are much more common. We know there's multiple muscles as well as growth plates in this area that can be affected. In res regards to kids, you have a growth plate that's on the top part of your femur that makes up your hip joint. Groin pain in kids is never to be taken lightly. If your child has a, even a couple days of groin pain, I recommend seeking emerg a care in either a pediatric orthopedist office or a sports medicine specialist to make sure that there's not any of these more concerning pathologies. Just to name a few, skiffy or slipped capital femoral epiphysis is something very common in kids, and that's where this ball actually falls off of this shaft portion right here and forms an improper angle. That can have devastating consequences to a hip long term and lead to early arthritis and is emergently treated surgically if it is found. So this is very important, we don't miss this. Avulsion fractures are getting more and more common where there's weakness of the growth plates and the cartilage around the pelvis in kids, so we're seeing those more frequently, as well as stress fractures due to poor nutrition in our kids. Femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, and labral tears are a new and upcoming uh, diagnosis that we're learning a lot more about and realizing that a lot of these groin strains or groin pulls really are falling into this category of FAI and labral tears, so really changing our management. And then the last thing that I want to reiterate is infections, is that if your child ever has groin pain and fevers, kids are more likely to get infections around their joint, and we need to make sure they don't have any of those. In red flags, just to kind of cover the couple things I talked about, is if your child has groin pain, they have inability to bear weight. They won't put any weight on their leg at all. If they won't move their hip and they prefer to keep their hip in a flexed position, more common. If they're having any sort of fevers or pain beyond a couple of days, I would seek emergency care, either in your pediatricians, your pediatric orthopedist's office, or in a sports medicine specialist's office. Treatment can really vary. As I said, this, is, this groin pathology is really a broad category, and so treatment can vary. Anything from crutches and observation and anti-inflammatories to emergency surgery, even as early as that immediate night. To move down to knee injuries, which is most people are most commonly associated with, and which is the main thing we see a lot of, particularly in our young adolescent females, uh, we're gonna touch on a couple broad categories. There's so much knee pathology, I don't have enough time to really talk about it today, but I'd be happy to ask, an answer your questions either in an office visit or later on via our Twitter hashtag. Acute knee pain, which is that sudden onset knee pain, chronic knee pain, which is that long ongoing knee pain, or popping in the knee are the three top categories I'd like to talk with you about today. First of all, red flags, important things for parents and coaches and everybody who takes care of young athletes that they should know. When you need to take your, pa your uh, patient or your child to an emergency room or urgent care, some important things to know. If something looks out of place, definitely take them to the emergency room. If they have any sort of deformity that the leg just doesn't look right, you should take them to the emergency room. If they have large cuts or breaks in their skin, they should be seen in an emergency room. If they can't put any pressure on their leg or move their knee at all, I would bring them to an emergency room. And if they have an intolerable amount of pain, they're absolutely inconsolable, I would bring them to an emergency room. Things that maybe can wait to the next day or to be evaluated uh, within the next one to three days are if they notice that it's painful to just bend or straighten completely their knee, if they're able to bend it somewhat but it's just those end ranges of motion, that typically can wait a couple days. If they have pain that really lasts beyond a few days and isn't resolved with easy treatments such as some ice and some anti-inflammatories, I would be seen in a sports medicine specialist's office. Pain that requires around-the-clock medication, you just keep giving Motrin or Tylenol and it's not seeming to resolve the pain, I would be seen pretty soon in an office. If you notice that they have swelling that seems to be worsening, that's also a red flag as to when to bring them into the office. And that swelling, if it just comes up and goes away by the next morning, not as concerning, but if that swelling pops up in the knee and stays for several days, even to a week, that's something I would be concerned about and bring someone, in, being uh, your child or patient, into our office. So just to go through our couple broad topics, acute knee pain. So again, that's that sudden onset pain. And I can tell you in my office, I very commonly get referrals for the knee sprain. And that's a difficult thing because there's so many things that can be sprained around the knee. There are four main ligaments in the knee, but the two most commonly ones that we see injured are the ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament or the MCL, which is the medial collateral ligament. 
The ACL sits in the central portion of your knee and helps you with twisting type motions. The MCL is on the very inside portion of your knee, right between your knees, and that helps with giving stability and side to side type motions for your knee. Inside your knee is something that's called your meniscus, which is a C-shaped cartilage that helps provide shock absorption between your two bones. That's something that can commonly be injured and that can be difficult to diagnose unless you're properly trained. And kneecap or patella dislocations. That's something that can often be missed when a child doesn't really remember the exact mechanism of how something happened, but they have a large amount of swelling and a lot of pain with any range of motion. The other things that can, be hap that can be happening instead of a knee sprain is you could actually have fractures or broken bones as we know. You can have growth plate fractures. There's ones, two very important growth plates at the bottom of your femur or your thigh bone and then the top of your tibia, which is your shin bone, and those can get injured. There's also a small bone inside the, the central portion of your knee called your tibial spine and that can commonly get injured in our young athletes. There's some rare types of patella fractures that adults don't get that children do get because of that, how the patella grows. That's something to make sure that they don't have and that's something we need to watch out for. And then osteochondral fracture. So that's a small shearing off of a piece of bone and cartilage that can happen as part of injuries. That's more commonly seen in our young athletes than our older athletes. How to follow up with this. So typically you're gonna to go to your doctor's office and get an x-ray. An x-ray shows us the bones of the, of the knee and that will show us if there are any fractures, anything that's out of place or any injuries we need to be worried about. Unfortunately, it doesn't show us everything that's part of the knee. So if we're concerned about a ligament injury, such as that ACL or MCL, or if we're worried about that meniscus, we'll follow it up with an MRI. As you can see here in this x-ray, this is one of those special patella type fractures that only kids get. And you can see there's some fragmentation or small chips of bone that are the indication of this fracture. That's the type of thing we can see on the x-ray. On the MRI, this is an example of an ACL tear. The ACL should be in a cross pattern this direction. You can see it really is not there anymore. Those are the types of things we see on MRIs. Treatment again can vary because we need to know exactly what the problem is and can vary from something as simple as a brace or a cast uh, or some physical therapy, but there are some of these problematic conditions that do require surgery, which is why specialty care is so important. So now to go over to chronic knee pain, which is a bit, very common thing and seems to be growing in our, in our pediatric patients. Most of these are going to be overuse injuries, meaning that children are just being too active without properly warming up and taking care of their bodies. The most common ones that we see is something called Osgood-Schlatter, which I think most people are familiar with. That's an irritation of a growth plate down in the top portion of your shin bone uh, that causes a small bump and irritation there. There's numerous different tendons that run around the knee, so tendonitis is another part that's very common, and most commonly it's the patella tendon, which connects the patella or the kneecap to that tibia or shin bone. Patellofemoral syndrome is also something we're seeing more and more, which is a malalignment of the kneecap within the bottom portion of the femur. It often is due to a muscle imbalance when some muscles are too tight and other muscles are too weak, and a common source of pain. Although none of these things are specifically dangerous, they can be very problematic and nuisance for patients and have them have to come out of sports that they enjoy and change their training. Two other things that are more important that can sometimes lead to surgery is a new thing we're really learning about which is called osteochondritis desiccans, which is a bone and cartilage problem that you can see here in this MRI. Normal healthy bone is white. This dark bone here is a sign of dead bone. The bone has been seeing too much load, too much stress, so it actually dies. And we worry about the cartilage that sits on top of it and the health of that cartilage. We see this in numerous joints, but most commonly it is seen in the knee joint, although we do see it in the ankle as well as in the elbow. Meniscus tears of different types can also cause chronic pain, and that's something that really takes specialist hands in order to find on a physical exam. Usually this will require an MRI as well, and you can see these on these MRI, these triangular shaped discs here in between the femur and the tibia. That's your meniscus, and you can see this white line through it right here, indicating that there is a tear. How do we follow up with these? Well, you really need a specialist in particular times when you've had ongoing knee pain. Really, we need to know about the story. What is the symptoms? What makes things better? What makes things worse? I'm sure everyone's kind of poked around their joint to try and find out where it hurts, but knowing where the patient thinks the pain's coming from often can be very helpful. 
Sometimes pain logs and pain journals can also be very helpful if you're going in to see a provider. Growth history is very important because a lot of these conditions actually relate to when growth, what growth spurts or peak growth is really happening. So knowing if your child's going through one of those growth spurts can also give us some important information. As I've reiterated, the physical exam, actually having the medical provider find where the pain is in the knee is very important, can help guide our treatment and decide if any advanced imaging is really needed. You will typically go through some x-rays initially to make sure there aren't any of those scary other conditions, such as that OCD. It's the main thing we really look for. But the provider, once they've done a physical exam, will determine if an MRI or a CT scan, any other important imaging is needed. Again, treatment can vary depending on what it is, but thankfully, this is very often treated non-operatively with a brace, potentially a cast, but that would be very rare. Physical therapy is really the mainstay of this because it's really often a soft tissue injury relating to a muscle imbalance of some being too tight and some being too weak. Last resort would be surgery for pain and symptoms that just really aren't resolving, but thankfully that's very rare. Now to go on to the popping knee. The big message for this is that pop, joints pop all of the time. We crack our knuckles, people can crack their necks, do different things. That doesn't bother me. But if you have painful popping that, ouch, that really hurts, feels like something's getting stuck and shifting and moving out of place, that's the important thing that you need to tell a provider about. This can be caused by a variety of things, such as cartilage damage that's getting caught, kneecap or patella subluxations where it's moving in and out of place, meniscus tears as I've talked about, or maybe you have a loose body, you have a piece of bone or cartilage that's floating around your knee that's causing that's popping. Those are all very problematic and in the long-term health of your knee can cause further damage inside your knee. So we need to know if there's painful popping sooner than later. Although sometimes brace and physical therapy can be the treatment choice, more often it is surgical, again, because these conditions don't really respond well to the non-operative treatment. Lastly, I'd like it down to the very bottom of the lower extremity to the ankle and how one big difference between kids and adults is the ankle sprain versus an ankle fracture. Just to review, a sprain is a ligament injury and as I've highlighted in yellow here, there's a couple main ligaments that are on the outside portion of your ankle that cause ankle sprains. That tissue is stretched and it's important to know that when it heals, it heals with the scar tissue. It doesn't heal with normal ligament tissue which is very different than if you have an actual ankle fracture. That's the bone injury. The good thing about that is that bone heals back with bone, as does cartilage. And you can see in the comparison of these two x-rays of an adult ankle versus a child's ankle, you can see those growth plates that we've been talking to. Where these ligaments attach are all very near these growth plates, and we know the weakest portion of the musculoskeletal system in a kid is in the growth plate. So it's actually much more common when kids have an ankle sprain that they've really injured this growth plate. And that's something important to know because it can change our treatment. How do you know the difference? So an ankle sprain, there's usually swelling on the outside part of an ankle and you're going to be more painful around the, around the bone, not so much on the bone. That's really the big difference. If you press on the outside portion of your bone, which is really prominent in most people, if that bone hurts, I'd be very concerned that there's an actual injury to the bone. The treatment's a little bit different as well. Ankle sprains, we get them more aggressively moving. Maybe it's just a little ace wrap, a couple days on crutches, but we want them moving to prevent stiffness, which is one of the long-term worries of ankle sprains. In comparison, ankle fractures really need time to heal. It's a bone injury. So they can either be put into a cast or a walking boot to immobilize them. The return to sport can be similar, but the big difference is that, again, the ankle fracture, if you have that fracture, bone heals with bone, and the recurrence rate of that happening is actually pretty low. Whereas with ankle sprains, if you don't treat them properly the first time, you can have problems with recurrence of them happening again and again. Lastly, if you have long, long standing ankle pain or chronic ankle pain, people who have recurrent ankle sprains or problems with their ankles and how they've formed can often get this chronic ankle pain. Sometimes it's due to improperly treated injuries when people were younger as our young athletes. The most common cause that we see, as I've alluded to, is that OCD that can happen in the talus, which is this portion of the ankle bone on the bottom. Sometimes this actually causes instability of the ankle joint, as you can see in this x-ray, that the bone actually shifts out of place, and that's what's causing their pain. Our concern is that long term, if either of these conditions continues, that you would have wear and tear of your ankle joint leading to ankle arthritis. 
How do we treat chronic ankle pain? Well, it can be variable, and most often it is with a brace in physical therapy. But depending on how long it's been going on, surgery may be a possibility for making this pain better. Um, I'd like to just uh, conclude with things of some top five take-home points from today. As I hope you've gotten the point that young athletes are not the same as adult athletes, and hopefully you know from the anatomy lesson now why that is. You need to know and abide by our restrictions that we have for our young athletes. Those restrictions, such as pitch counts, really are in place to protect our athletes, and we've shown good evidence that we actually can help prevent some of these overuse injuries by restricting some of these activities. We know that activity-related pain should never be avoided in a child. If you shouldn't be telling your, your child or anybody you're coaching to play through the pain, that typically makes things worse and can have long-term complications on their joints and on their health. Some reasons we've gone over is all the red flags of when you should go in and see someone who's a specialist in pediatric sorts medicine, such as myself. If your child has continued pain and swelling, you should, you should see someone, especially if it's lasted beyond a week or so. If they are actually taking themselves out of play and saying they cannot play, that's a big red flag. Kids want to do anything they can to play, so if they're taking themselves out, they really are pretty hurt. If they're not using their leg at all or their arm, refusing to use it at all, they should be seen pretty immediately. And then if you're noticing that you're more frequently needing to give them ice, Motrin, ibuprofen, Tylenol, any of those types of things, you should see someone because there may be a better treatment for them. Lastly, many of these injuries can be avoided, and I'd like to give you some important prevention tips on how you can avoid these injuries. Learning proper sports technique is the number one most important thing. As a child's growing and learning where their fingers and toes and the top of their head are, it can be a little bit difficult to teach proper technique, but it's something that it's very important as parents and coaches that you reinforce with your children. Also, as they're growing and their muscles are going through changes, uh, making sure to teach proper warm-up and cool-down techniques is very important. Also, we're learning more that we want to avoid any early single sport specialization. You want your child to play a plethora of sports because then they're using different muscles, they're having fun, learning different techniques, and they're going to become in the long run better athletes and also just be more lifelong activity uh, participants if we can get them involved in multiple sports. We also want to encourage free unstructured play. Go out and play in the park. Go out and play tag. It's important for their mental and psychological health. They have some unstructured play time as well. As always, getting enough rest to allow for recovery time. And in the end, the important thing is they should be having fun. Participation in sports we know have great long-term health important consequences if you don't involve yourself. But you need to make sure it's fun so that that way they continue for the rest of their life to be active in all of these sports. And it doesn't just stop when they're a young um, adult transitioning into college. So if you'd like more information, hopefully this has sparked some questions that we're going to go through here in just a second. You can reach us at OIC Sports Medicine at mednet.ucla.edu. We have two different clinics, both down in Santa Monica at 16th and Wilshire in the Luskin Children's Clinic, as well as out at the Orthopedic Institute for Children at our Center for Sports Medicine in downtown Los Angeles. There's some information for appointments, as well as you can get more information at ortho-institute.org. I'll leave this slide up in just one second. I want to just emphasize going to our Twitter feed and going to hashtag UCLAMDChat so that we can answer some questions that we're going to go through right now. And I do want to thank you guys for your time, for tuning in. Hopefully you've learned something and we can help prevent some of these injuries. So I'm going to go through some of the questions that have come up here. So some of the important questions that can be very difficult to answer is, how do you decide if your child's ready to go back to sports? Is how long is, how much pain can they have? How much symptoms can they have? That can be a very difficult question to answer. And I think that a lot of parents really try and help guide their patients and guide their children. But it's something that often, if you've had to take your child out of sport, I would recommend seeing a sports medicine specialist to make sure that you have the proper training to return them, but also you have the guidance and education to prevent whatever took them out in the first place. So a lot of times some of the criteria I look for is they need to be able to go up and down on their toes, hop up and down, do some sort of functional activities without any pain, hesitation, or problem. If they have any continued symptoms of pain, swelling, any of that popping we were taking, talking about earlier, those would all be reasons that they're not ready to go back yet. They need to be pretty much pain-free and doing functional things before I'll let someone go back to sports. Uh, and how much time do you have to take off from sports injuries? So that can be really variable, and that's a conversation that I have very openly with my families and my patients when they come in to see me. 
and really try and talk about where are you in season? Is this something that I need to actually stop you mid-season from, from continuing to play and it's that important? Or is this something that we can work through over the next week or two to get you through to that championship game? That's an open conversation and dialogue, and sometimes the answer is very clearly, I have to take them out. And that's a very difficult discussion to have sometimes, but I have to look for the overall health of the child and their, and their limb. But sometimes I'm able to do a little bit more negotiating and say, well, let's try these couple of things to get you through this, the end of your season, but then we're gonna have to take you out so that we can really address this problem. So it can be very variable. And how do you prevent the injury from coming back? Hopefully I gave you some tips uh, earlier in my talk about how to prevent things from coming back. The most important thing is making sure that you are getting enough rest, making sure you're allowing your body to recover, that you're going through proper warm up and cool downs, as well as making sure that you know proper technique that the sport that you're involved in. Those are all things that can help you change and also adapt to your sport, but prevent any further injuries from happening. So I'd like to thank everybody for listening to our uh, webinar today. If you have any further questions, please address them either to our office. I'm happy to see you in our office anytime or address them at our website here. Thank you very much.